Well, I want to welcome you. Uh, we have an incredible weekend plans, and I don't know if you're like me, but 2020, uh, this past year, it was difficult on relationships, and that's why I think this series we've been in that we're going to wrap up today has been so critically important, because what we're doing in this series is we're just looking at each week one thing that Jesus, the greatest relationship guru of all time, said would help transform our relationships, and that's a, a friendship, that could be a coworker, that could be a, a child, it could be obviously your marriage. I was thinking this past week about my marriage and, and I was realizing that I think when I was around 18 years old, believe it or not, a, a long time ago, this young Arizona boy thought that maybe one day when I was dating Jamie that I would maybe be the greatest husband this world has ever known. And then I got married. You know, it's like you, you realize how much work we really have. And so week one, we talked about, if you remember, we talked about being more present in our relationship, something Jesus was perfect at. Uh, week two, we talked about being less critical. Week three, uh, this past week, we talked about being more selfless. And today, the thing about relationships that we are gonna dig into that Jesus role modeled perfectly is this, being less oblivious and more aware. Let me ask you, in your relationships today, whether it's a marriage or a friendship, have you ever felt like the person you're in a relationship with is just oblivious to who you are? They want you to see the world only through their lens, not your unique lens? Of course you have. And so we have to learn how to do this better because it's so important, and you're gonna see that today. And one of the ways Jesus did this is Jesus just role modeled this perfectly. If you really study the life of Jesus, he was perfectly aware of who he was and he was perfectly aware of everyone around him. Why? Because Jesus actually could read minds. He, he knew people's hearts. He could see their motives. And it even says this in Mark chapter two, verse eight, to prove it. It says Jesus knew immediately, when he was around a group of people, he knew immediately what they were thinking. Jesus could read people's minds, see their hearts. Don't you wish you had that ability? Don't you wish you could read everyone's mind around you, your spouse's mind? If you could, you would never say this to your spouse again. What were you thinking? you'd already know. Obviously, we're not gonna be Jesus. We can't write, read people's minds, but we can learn to be more aware. And to do that, I've invited a very special guest this weekend. His name is Ian Morgan Cron. He's a national you know, best-selling author. He's a, a very sought-after speaker. And what he's gonna talk to us about today is how to drive a better level of awareness. So without further ado, would you give, help me give a really huge CCB welcome, welcome to Ian Morgan Cron. My man. I, I have been waiting so much for this weekend. Um, you came and talked to our staff la last year and it was so powerful, I just couldn't wait for you to come speak to our church. And, but for those people who maybe don't even know who you are, um, give, us just a, <laughs> give us a little introduction. Who is Ian? All right. Um, well, first and foremost, I'm the husband of the most amazing woman in the world. Good brownie points, good. Right, she's not even here. That's I know, fantastic. she'll watch it, she'll see it. Uh, her name is Anne, we've been married for 32 years. I'm a father, I have three children. That's right, thank That's you very much, yeah. amen, hallelujah. Um, <laughs> uh, three kids, um, I am a trained psychotherapist, um, a pastor, I'm, uh, and another big feature of my life is, um, I'm a person in long-term recovery from drug and alcohol addiction. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that's something to be celebrated. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's right, I'm not loose in your community right now, so you're all going, I'm so glad he's well. <laughs> um, uh, so, and that, I, I only say that because that, that piece of my story has been a tremendous blessing in my life. Um, it's really a story of how God has leveraged uh, something broken into something beautiful. Yeah. One of my favorite things, getting to know you, um, which has been really fun for me, by the way, to call you a friend, is just to see this, this balance you have between you are a pastor, you pastored a church, you went to seminary, but you also have been trained as a psychotherapist, and you're able to take those two things and use them in such a powerful way way, and as we're talking about the idea of how powerful self-awareness is, awareness in relationships, I would love to hear from you, what is your perspective of how, of how important that is to having a healthy relationship? Speak mm -hmm. to us about that. Well, you know, I do a lot of corporate work, 
And so there's a study that was done years ago at Cornell University, and they wanted to figure out what was it that made a particular set of very successful CEOs, what trait or characteristic in their person made them so successful. So they studied them, a deep longitudinal study, and um, they thought it would be grit, determination, um, strategic planning, you know, all these different things. What they discovered upended all the researchers' expectations. Here's a line from the study at the conclusion. It said, the key predictor of success among leaders is self-awareness. Hmm. Now, as I thought about that as a therapist, as a pastor, it really came to me that I would say the key predictor of success in human relationships, not just husband and wife, but as parent, as friend, as colleague, as, you know, in every sphere, the key predictor of success in relationships is self-awareness. And so we're clear Let's just describe what self-awareness is because it's a squishy term. I would, uh, for our purposes, define self-awareness as self-knowledge leading to um, an awareness of how does my personality affect other people? How does my habit habitual, predictable ways of acting, thinking, and feeling serve me or defeat me? Hmm. How do I monitor and self-regulate the way that I act, think, and feel in the moment so that I can move through the world with more emotional wisdom, kindness, love, thoughtfulness, consciousness, um, so that I'm not just on autopilot banging guardrail to guardrail through, through people's lives? Hmm. That's so good, and I wanna repeat what you said for someone to hear today. The key predictor of success in a relationship is, is having self-awareness, being aware, not only of who you are and how you come across, but being aware of other people. Yes. How God, and how God has really designed them uniquely. Um, so key. Ta talk to me about how this awareness not only helps our relationships with each other, but also with God. Yes, thank you. The, it's interesting, you know, um, John Calvin, the great theologian, uh, Calvin, at the very beginning of his most famous work, The Institutes, says, without knowledge of self, there is no knowledge of God. And let me stop you for a second, because I, I remember reading that for the very first time, epic theologian John Calvin, and I remember when I heard that, there, without knowledge of self, there is no knowledge of God, I thought, I wanted to push back initially, I wanted to say, wait a second, I, why can't I have a knowledge of God? Why is that dependent on me having a knowledge of myself? Un unpack that a little more. Well, I think there's a lot of answers. It's a very deep subject, but let me just give you a highlight of it that I think is really important. A person who lacks self-knowledge lacks the awareness of their profound need for grace. If you are not acutely aware of your brokenness, your shadow, those parts of you that uh, are working against God's plan of redemption in your life and in the world, then you will not have the, ne the necessary quality of humility to move in the world successfully. Yeah. So I think that that's, you know, that knowledge of self. You know, I grew up in a church that said knowledge of self, that's egotistical. Oh, that's, you know, making the gospel into psychology. You know, this is, you know what I mean, into a self-help sort of a thing. It is, a, it is catastrophic to go through life without truly, it's, it's tragic to go through life without becoming uh, knowledgeable about your inner world, why you act, think, and feel, and relate to people the way that you do. And if you, you know, and if you never bring the way that you act, think, and feel, and relate to people into alignment with how God wants you to be in the world. That's so good. I, I, I... There's so much to unpack there. I wish we had more time, but I just think, you know, the Bible says that all of us have sin. And I, I think sometimes if you're someone here today, and I know there's some of you that are not Jesus followers here today, and we're so glad you're here, but to, to, to say even that you maybe don't need God might be an indicator that you haven't really searched deeply to who, who you are and that, that self-awareness. Because when you really understand, when, when I look at myself more deeply, I see more and more of how deeply I need God. And it helps me with my relationships. Now, this idea of self-awareness is so important. 
so important to relationships. How do we become more self-aware? Hmm. What, what do we do? It ain't easy. Right? Usually it's very expensive, you know? <laughs> um, we are not built with a hatch that we can just open up and look inside of ourselves and get a really clear picture of, of who we are. Um, you know, we, it's interesting, you know, the, the mind, the unconscious mind, and maybe this, is, this is speaks to, you know, what even Scripture says this, I think, and I think you'll touch on it maybe, that um, the unconscious mind has a way of diverting its own attention when it starts to look at hard truths about itself. So true. Is that right? So true. In, 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 in the 12-step program that I'm involved in, we always like to say uh, that um, denial which is what I'm talking about, is refusing to know what you know. That's good. About yourself, right? And so when the mind starts to go, when the eye of the mind starts to go toward our brokenness, it goes, I'd rather think about something else, right? I'd rather look at your brokenness and talk to you about that. You know what I'm saying? So much easier. I want yeah. to talk about your brokenness on my own. Yeah, yeah, right? So anyway, it's not easy, right? We can't look inside and just go, oh, look, there goes my mommy issues. You know, it's like, eh, that's not so easy, you know? Uh. It's so hard we, to do. So we need tools, yeah. right? We need tools that can help us get there faster, right? That save us time on the journey of self-discovery. Yeah. I love what uh, Jeremiah says, that, a, that the heart is deceitful. You know, this, this great verse, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. You know, we, we can so easily deceive ourselves, about why we're doing what we're doing and just, and just ignore it. We can, we can almost ignore the, our, our need for self-awareness. So like you said, we need tools to drive better awareness with us and the people around us. And I think that you have, um, you, you are, my opinion, the world-renowned expert on a great tool called the Enneagram. And I want you to just talk to us about that, what it is, um, how it, it can help us. But before you do, I just wanna tell you my own personal experience with the Enneagram. Um, the first time I ever heard about the Enneagram was I had a teenage daughter um, who had started you know, diving into it, and she said, Dad, you, you have to check out this new personality typing system, this new personality test. And my first reaction was, that is the last thing our world needs is another personality test. I mean, we have so many, right? I've, I've done them all. I've, we, I've done DISC, Myers-Briggs, you know, Strength Finders. You know, I've tried to figure out if I'm you know, an otter, you know, a seahorse, or a golden retriever, whatever it is, you know? Have you ever noticed all those animal tests, though, that, that there's never a cat, as an example? <laughs> and you know the reason why, okay? Pure evil. Anyway, so, so, you know, so I was thinking, like, we don't need another personality test. And yet, as I kind of reluctantly dug into this, I was amazed. And I'll just throw my cards on the table. My personal opinion, this is the best personality assessment on the market today to drive awareness and that's why I really wanted Ian here. So Ian, talk to us about just what is the Enneagram and how can we understand it? And give us a brief overview. And you know, people are gonna have, well, can dive a little bit deeper, obviously, on their own. But give us a brief overview. So the Enneagram is a personality typing system that teaches that there are nine basic personality types in the world, one of which we naturally gravitate toward and adopt in childhood as a way to feel safe, uh, to protect ourselves, uh, and to navigate the new world of relationships we, we find ourselves in. And very importantly, each of those personality types possesses an unconscious motivation that powerfully influences how that type acts, thinks, and feels on a consistent basis. I want to I speak to that just for a moment because this is, to me, the power of what differentiates this personality typing system from the others, is that it actually gives you an, an underlying motivation of why you do the things you do. Yes. And it speaks to that. And, and the other tests, you correct me if I'm wrong, really talk about this is kind of what you do, but it doesn't really talk about the motivation. Right. Well, one of the great things that we oftentimes say in the Enneagram is that what you do is not as important as why you do it, right? right? Knowing what you do is not as important as knowing why you do it, right? And because, as you mentioned, the heart is deceitful, right? We might say that the, the things that motivate us, that drive us, are generally beyond our awareness, 
we just don't know that they're operating in the system. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're just in the background, and we don't really know. What is, like, let me ask you guys a question. How many of you, and the older, I guarantee you that the older the group gets, the more they will nod their head when I say this. How many of you find yourself caught up in a web of repetitions where you have repeatedly said, done, and acted in ways that were not in your best interest, and you've done it repeatedly throughout yeah. your life. Nervous laughter. This, yeah. <laughs> right? The, yeah, the older people are going, yeah. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you just look in your rearview mirror and you see, the, you see the wreckage or you see the patterns, right? Where, where you have, and so what ends up happening is you do the very things you don't want to do and you don't do the things that you want to do and you sit there going, I don't get it. It's because in many ways, that this unconscious motivation is running underneath our lives, driving behaviors, and we can't see it. And once you can, self-awareness, then you can begin to make different choices and live in the world in a different way. So, nine types, right? In fact, let's just, let's just take a look at them. So here are the nine types. And by the way, welcome to you know, Christ Church of the Valley's uh, newest sermon series, The Power of the Pentagram. I, I think you're, you're going to... Some, of, some people are in the audience, right in the room, they're going, I told you, it's satanic. <laughs> you know? I knew it. Stop giving to the church. This is terrible. We have gone off the rails. <laughs> the word Enneagram simply means ennea, derives from the Greek. Nine, gram, means drawing. So all this is, is a nine-pointed drawing around which we have these nine personality um, styles mapped out, Okay. So, why don't we just walk through the types, right? Love it. So, let's talk about the improvers, all right? These are called, the, these are ones on the Enneagram. So, improvers are people who are principled, ethical, morally heroic, detail-oriented. When they walk in a room, their attention immediately migrates to what's broken and how do I fix it? And that can be a thing or a person, how do I improve it? How do I make it better, right? The unconscious motivation of the one is a need to perfect themselves, others, and the world, okay? Now, if you wanna get a really quick guide as to how you can figure out if somebody's a one, y'all wanna know what it is? What are they gonna say, no? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, no, go home. Um, <laughs> you gotta do the dishwasher test. Some people in the room are going, I know what he's talking about. <laughs> you load a dishwasher, and then you stand back, and you watch if a one comes in and opens up that dishwasher. And they pull open the drawer, and you, they open it up, and they pull the drawer out, and they go. <sighs> Why can't anybody do this kind of thing? <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Chances are you got a one on your hand. So good. All right, let's go to twos. Give, give us a picture of the one. Real oh, okay, that's yeah. great. So there is a classic one, Nelson Mandela. Mandela. Yeah. Principled, morally heroic. Somebody who saw a broken system and could not help but feel an obligation or a duty to repair it. Yeah. Good. That's a healthy one. That's a self-aware one. Yeah. Now, the unhealthy one will lapse into this kind of, if they're not healthy and self-aware, this sort of judgmental, critical, um, sometimes shaming kind of person who sort of radiates this resentment that not everybody else is as concerned as they are about fixing everything that's broken. So good. Okay, now let's talk about twos. Twos are called the helpers. The most interpersonal number on the Enneagram. They go to bed at night thinking about relationships. They, you know, go to bed, they wake up in the morning, they're thinking about relationships. Mm. Warm, generous, supportive, kind, servant-hearted. These are people whose unconscious motivation is a need to meet the needs of others. They are so attuned, they're almost like psychic. They know what you need before you do, mm. and they will go out of their way to meet that need, right? Now, that can be a wonderful thing, but when it's not very healthy, you'll find them meeting your needs and serving you when you didn't ask for it. 
Do you all know the kind of person I'm talking about? You ever got hit with a love bomb? You know what I'm saying? The love bomb. It's like, you know, you tell you, well, I won't go into it, but you, you get the idea. But when they're healthy, they're like this guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Oh, Mr. Rogers. So that's a classic helper. Yeah. That warm, generous heart that seeks to serve the other without any expectation of return. Mm. Right? Let's move on to threes. So threes are called the performers. Do you know any threes? Could be me. I don't know. Yeah, I'm a three. Yeah, I'm a three. So the performer's unconscious motivation is a need to succeed, to appear successful, and to avoid failure at all costs. So you all are productivity machines. You're all about efficiencies. You are people who just adore a good to-do list, and you get high on this feeling of going check, 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 because the moment, the moment you check something, you can move some other Good project into yeah. it, right? Yeah. Front and center and, and do it. Um, you're people who have memorized book, David Allen's book, Getting Things Done. Yeah. We got we, some threes right there. We get things done, right? So we get things right? done. But of course, when you're not very self-aware, what begins to happen for the three is they begin to believe the lie that people only value who I am for my achievements, right. what I do, rather than for who I am inside. Mm -hmm. Okay? So here's a classic three. Tiger Woods. When you read his life story, you read the story of a young man whose identity became completely identified with his gift, and he had parents yeah. who... Um, communicated, whether they meant to or not, communicated to him that his value was associated with the next win, Thank you. right? Now you hear that as a little kid and suddenly you start to have that unconscious motivation yeah. and you start moving through the world in ways that are very unhealthy. And I know that about my own childhood, by the way. So, right. yeah. yeah. So moving on to fours. Individualists, the best number on the Enneagram by far. You're a four. Yes, I am. Yes, you are. All right. <laughs> so is Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Got some people in there. We'll talk about Jesus later. Let's talk about Jesus later. Uh, we'll, <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about Jesus later, okay? How does he feel about yeah, that? How's he, how's he feel? <laughs> <laughs> He's disappointed right now. <laughs> <laughs> so the individualists, they're um, complex human beings. They have a need to be special and unique in order to compensate for what they feel is something missing in their core makeup that everybody else seems to have that prevents them from finding true belonging in the world. Mm. So they're always on this quest to find, what is it missing in me? What, what is this nameless fatal flaw that's sort of cursing my life? And how do I, and so being special and unique is their way of compensating for it, right? So, um, we tend to be a little melancholy, broody, self-absorbed at our worst, but we're also very artistic. Fours are disproportionately represented in the, in the arts world. So I got invited to a dinner party. Uh, I frequently get invited to dinner parties. I think it's because people like me, and then I get there and realize what they wanted was an Enneagram workshop for the 15 people they invited for dinner that night. <laughs> My wife calls them Enneagram bushes, you know? So um, what? This guy, they put me next to this guy. He was so forest, right? He had this kind of, you know, sad sort of arti artistic sort of thing. And uh, he said, people tell me I'm a four, but I, I just, I don't know. I don't know. And when I told him that the patron saint of fours was Johnny Depp's character, Edward Scissorhands, <laughs> he just bowed his head like this and he shook it. And then he rolled up his sleeve and showed me this. You cannot make that up. Nope. You nailed them. If you don't think the Enneagram is accurate, uncannily accurate, you cannot make this up, right? Yeah. All right, let's move on to fives. Fives are called the investigators, um, amazing human beings, the most analytical number on the Enneagram, oftentimes the most emotionally detached number on the Enneagram, very private. 
These are people whose unconscious motivation is a need to gather knowledge and information, conserve limited energy, particularly for relationships, right? And they want to, they just, they, they, they just cannot stop consuming knowledge. And all of this is in service to fending off feelings of inadequacy. And also it's because they have a smaller tank for relationships than you or I do. And so they need to spend a lot of time alone to, to, to really charge up, right? Now, a good example of this would be, of course, this guy, right? That's kind of a stereotype, but that guy. And then more recently, this guy. If you have not seen the documentary Inside Bill's Brain, if you want to know what a five is like, watch that movie, yeah. right? Watch that movie. And it also goes to prove that not all fives are scientists who have, you know, plastic pocket protectors and wear their pants up here and, you know, maybe do a lot of gaming at night, right? Um, that's not the case. I mean, I love what he says about fives, I think, which is, you know, be nice to nerds. Chances are one day you're going to work for one. Yeah. <laughs> right? All right, let's move on to sixes. Sixes are called the loyalists. Their unconscious motivation is a need to feel safe, secure, and supported in what feels like to them a frightening, unpredictable, chaotic world, okay? So, sixes are the classic worst-case scenario thinkers. They are always scanning the horizon for what could go wrong, right? <laughs> I have a, like that, for example. That's a six. That's what a six sees when they're walking down the sidewalk. I'm not, I'm not fooling you. Yeah. They're like, they're going to fall through that grate, you know? <laughs> now, I have a friend of mine who's a six, and she likes to say, I suffer from pre-traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> I mean, right? Yes. I, had a, I have an aunt. Worst She's, case scenario. God bless her. She's gone now, um, which was something she was predicting for many years that this would happen. <laughs> Um, so one night when I was in, in, in high school, I said to her, hey, Ma, I, Aunt Pat, I am going tonight to see the Rolling Stones at Madison Square Garden. And the first words out of her mouth were, the moment you get there, find the exits. <laughs> I, why? She said, the moment you smell smoke, you run to the exit. And don't yell fire until you're at the exit. Otherwise, you'll be trampled to death going out. Wow. Wow. And then I said to her, and then I said to her, this was a different period of my life. Then I said to her, what are the chances that I'm not going to smell smoke at a Rolling Stones concert? Right. You know? <laughs> True. You know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, I'm saying. I'm saying. True. Pastor or not, you know what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, I okay. understand. <laughs> I'm aware, I am aware of what goes on, okay, in the world. <laughs> So anyway, the sixes are wonderful, wonderful human beings, right? But do you see what can happen when you live a life with this constant anxiety that really you have to continue to plan and think about what could go wrong in order to keep yourself safe? Yeah. And what that can do in the spiritual life to you, the negative effects. Okay, moving on to sevens. If... I could be any number on the, on the Enneagram. I oftentimes say, I would love to be a very healthy, self-aware nine, but really there's a part of me that wants to be a seven. I would, I would like to be a, like a Stephen Colbert seven on the Enneagram, but I'm actually a Bob Dylan four minus the talent, unfortunately. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Sevens have this unconscious motivation, a need to avoid psychological and emotionally painful feelings. Hmm. They're, they're afraid they're going to get stuck in them and never get out. You and I know you have a feeling like stuck, bored, disappointed, sad, mad. But those feelings are, are like weather patterns. They're going to blow in. They're going to blow out. Sevens are not so sure. They're afraid they're going to get stuck. So they're always living in the future. They're always thinking about the next great escapade, the next fun thing we're going to do. They're always planning new adventures, exotic new restaurants. And, you know, we're going to go on this trip to, you know, Turkey, and we're going to go naked skydiving, you know, and they're, right, and it's always like the fun thing, the fun thing, because they don't want to stay in the present moment where it's possible that they're going to experience emotionally distressing feelings. Let me give you a classic example of a seven, this guy. That is my son, Aiden, hmm. 
Who doesn't want to be him? Looks, looks like a blast. 23 years old. You know, in Switzerland, having fun, swing sets at yeah. 23, living at home with his parents, sucking the money out of us, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't want to be him? <laughs> Here's another guy that's a good friend of mine, Bob Goff. Mm. Aw, that was all the twos yeah. in the room. Yeah. All the twos just went, I love him. <laughs> That is a classic seven. I'm at Bob's house one time, and uh, we, we were in his, he lives in San Diego, and he lives on a beautiful harbor, and we're standing out in the water and up to our knees, and he looked at me and he said, you know, Ian, if I ever saw a shark, I would just tell myself it was a dolphin with teeth. <laughs> and I'm like, Bob, that is the most seven thing I have ever heard in totally. my life. Totally. It's like taking a really negative situation that would cause the rest of us a lot of fear, anxiety, and, you know, and flipping it on its head very quickly yeah. in order to say, no, no, this would be a good thing. Trying to escape bad feelings. The lesson in this, of course, is don't swim with Bob Goff. <laughs> yeah, really. Right? Yeah, yeah. You want to swim with a six. You everything's a shark. Everything's a shark. Everything's, everything's a, shark. a shark. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everything. Okay, moving on to eights. The challengers, larger than life, typically aggressive, confrontational, domineering. Um, and again, to the degree that they're self-aware, right? Um, these are people whose unconscious motivation is a need to assert control and strength over the environment and other people in order to mask vulnerable uh, and tender feelings. Right? They see a world that is hostile, a might-makes-right world where you have got to be tough and you have got to be defended. Otherwise, people are going to betray you, take advantage of you. So never, never show them. Never show them the soft side. You know what I mean? Yep. Never show them that side. Right? Now, a healthy eight is a remarkable human. My mother's an eight, okay? Which is why I became a therapist, <laughs> all right? Um, <laughs> So my mother is 92 years old. For the last 75 years, she has smoked a pack of Pall Malls every single day. All right? So I call her on the phone at the beginning of COVID. Oh, well, trust me, there's more. <laughs> okay? If you, I heard a few people go, oh, that's terrible. It's like, oh, no, 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 you have no idea. <laughs> this gets worse. I call her on the phone, and I said to her, I said, uh, you know, a year ago, I said, so has, has the COVID virus attacked you yet? Without a blink on the other end of the phone. It wouldn't dare. <laughs> yeah. Classic eight. My mother could start an argument in an empty house. <laughs> I am not fooling you. She totally could. Yeah. Right? Now, when an eight is self aware in operating that, all that energy, all that power is operating from a pool of love, mm. then you get this guy. That's a, that's a healthy eight on the Enneagram. Yeah, yeah. So they can be world changers. Lastly, let's talk about the peacemakers. These are the sweethearts of the Enneagram. Don't rock the boat. Go with the flow. Hakuna Matata human beings. <laughs> Their unconscious motivation is a need to uh, keep the peace, Maintain inner harmony, tranquility. They just want to be chill. Just let me be chill, you know? And so for them, they need to avoid conflict at all costs, right? Now, if eights, you know, eights are, are people that, um, they have more energy than any other number on the Enneagram. You know, like that, uh, most of us run on those little two-prong plugs, you know, like 120 volts, right? Well, eights, they run on that plug behind your dryer. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. The one that you're afraid to plug in because it might blow up the house. Yes. You know that feeling? Okay, we're going to plug it in. Everyone outside on the lawn. You know what I mean? That's, that's what I feel like, but I'm a four. I write a poem about it. Anyway. <laughs> the, um, the, the, the nine runs on about 90 volts. Mm. They have the least stamina than any other number on the Enneagram. My wife, who's a nine, likes to say, uh, you know, we nines, uh, we start off slow and then we taper off. <laughs> it's 
good. It's good. Right? It's good. You know, we tend not to think of them as being powerhouses, mm -hmm. right? We tend to think of them as like sort of being slow and not very. Our best presidents have all been nines. Mm -hmm. For example, like this one. That is a classic nine mm -hmm. on the Enneagram, right? He's off in Camp David riding a horse, just having a great time. The rest of the world is going to heck in a handbasket, but Ron's out there just riding his horse, you know? <laughs> but actually, one of his, really his genius characteristics is this guy could make a deal with anybody. And that's why we call them the peacemakers or the mediators. It's because these folks can reconcile the seemingly irreconcilable. They can bring people to the table, build consensus, and what do they do? Make deals. Mm -hmm. They're brilliant at making deals. Eights, not so much. Right. Authoritarian. But that nine, man, they're a, they're a community consensus builder and they get stuff done that way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's a quick... Yeah, very quick run through and of the. What, and what I love Indian. about it, to me, is that you know it, it's not only what you do, how you operate. Remember this: the power to me in this is it strips mind what's your underlying motivation for why you operate the way you do, yeah. and that is that is so powerful. And I want to I want to just highlight that for again. I want you to notice that every unconscious motivation I just said, I need to improve. Let me put it this way: in order to feel loved, I have to improve the world. I must meet the needs of others if I'm gonna be loved. I have to be successful if I'm gonna be loved. Uh, I, I um, have to be special and unique if I'm gonna be loved. I have to um, accrue knowledge and be, if I'm gonna feel safe. Mm -hmm. I need to be uh, planning for the worst if I'm gonna be safe. I have to find joy and like be in denial about things that aren't safe. Uh, I need to assert power and strength of the environment to protect the world, you know, kind of like to protect my heart and also to feel some control. I need to be a peacemaker to have some control over my inner world. I, do you see where I'm going? Yes. Every single one, this is how I know it, this is why the Enneagram helps. Every single one of those propositions is in direct opposition to the story of the gospel. Amen. And when you can figure that out, you can start to spot yourself acting, thinking, and feeling in ways that are not consistent or aligned with the purposes in the heart of God. Right. And again, the Enneagram is not the gospel. It's not the Bible. Oh, no, no, That's no, still no. true. It's just a tool. I it's did just... not find it in a cave in Syria like Jim right, Harrison right. Ford. It's, you know, it's, it, not... it's just a tool. But what, what Ian just said I think is so powerful because all of us over time, even from our childhood, we put on a shell. We put on a mask to begin to try to protect ourselves in some way, to keep ourselves safe or to guard ourselves against this world. And what God wants for you so desperately is to take off the mask, to take off the shell. Um, not, not the mask like we're wearing during COVID, I mean the mask that is covering something. I like how Paul put it, Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians 4 two. he said, we, we refuse to wear masks and play games. Right? We're gonna take that off. He said this in uh, actually in 1 Thessalonians 2, 5. He said, you know, we never use flattery, nor do we put on a mask. And in many ways, that's what many of us need to do as followers of Jesus is we've, to operate healthy in a relationship, we have to understand our motivations, why we do what we do, and figure out how we can be our most healthy selves. And I really feel like that's what this does for relationships. Ian, I know we don't have a lot of time, but tell us how can this play into helping our relationships when we truly understand this better? I mean, the Enneagram has revolutionized relationships all over the world. I, on a personal note, for example, when I learned the Enneagram, my marriage was under severe strain. We were kind of holding on like this. And I remember when we learned the Enneagram, we were at a workshop in Texas, and we went back to the hotel room and we, we cried together. It was like I met my wife for the first time, and we had been married for over 20 years. Hmm. And we were able to look at each other and go, I didn't know, I took it personally. I, I just, I didn't know that this was being driven by a wound that you got in childhood and that you, you began to believe this lie about the world and about yourself and it created this shell and, and I just want you to know you're safe. Hmm. And what came up in me as it does for so many people is Compassion, empathy, understanding. We were able to find a new language to talk about our problems. And it made a marriage that is now better than it's ever been before, right? 
And I'll just close with, do I have time for one last story? Yeah. Too bad, I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, <laughs> so uh, a friend of mine who's an Enneagram teacher taught a day-long workshop. And at the workshop, uh, a guy came up at the end of the day, big guy, and not all eights are big guys, but this was a big eight, right? And he said to her, I just realized today that I'm a challenger. And I have a son who has barely spoken to me for the past seven or eight years because as a father, I thought it was my duty to turn him into a facsimile or a copy of me. And what I realized after hearing all the types today is that my son is a four on the Enneagram. He's a poet. And I tried to turn him into a boxer. So the guy went home that night and he called his son, who again, they rarely spoke. The son was very hesitant about coming over. They sat together at the, din at the kitchen table and he said that they just wept together as dad shared what he had learned about himself and about his son during the course of the day. And they got the notes out and he's telling them what, and they're just epiphany after epiphany, right? And uh, dad was able to tell him, I am so sorry. I didn't know who you were. I tried to make you into me. When in reality, what God was calling me to do was to help you become you. The guy called the, this, this teacher friend of mine two weeks later and uh, told her that her son, his son had died in a car accident three days earlier. And of course, she expressed sadness and condolences. And he said, yeah, it's terrible, but I'm calling to say thank you. Because if I hadn't gained that self-awareness and awareness about who he was, we would never have reconciled before he died. And, and so in closing, all I would say to you is this. There's a lot at stake in knowing ourselves and familiarizing ourselves with all these other kinds of people in the world. There's a lot at stake. Because how can we really love another person unless we understand them? We know their suffering. We know their gifts. We know their blessings. And we know their blights. And that's why I have so much confidence and joy when I get to share the message of how God can use this remarkable tool to change lives. Can we thank Ian for just uh, that amazing. I, uh, I wonder what's at stake for you in a friendship or with a child or with a marriage. And what we wanna do is we just wanna help you. Okay, again, this is just a tool to help you and if you would like to be able to take this assessment, and especially with the people around you, your relationships, um, I wanna encourage you to do that. You know, Ian's been so gracious to us to give us a discount code. He has a, a test that he has developed that's very extensive. You can use the discount code CCB20 and you can get on our mobile app and you can find out how to get that. I'd also encourage you, he wrote a book called The Road Back to You. Um, I think this is one of the best ways to understand truly your type. Um, if cost is an issue, please let us know, even on the test. Um, we we want to be able to, to help you. There's also a free version of the test on the mobile app. But we truly just want you to be able to drive more awareness in your relationships so that God can do what he wants to do through your life and through the lives of others. Um, Ian, I'd love for you to just close us out in prayer, if you would, and, and we'll, we'll dismiss. Let's stand up for it. Can we do that? Yeah. Good and gracious God, we, we thank you for the lives that you have given us, and we thank you for relationships. And this night I pray that we would make a commitment to understanding ourselves and perhaps the person standing next to us, that we might love our wives, our husbands, our daughters, our sons, our nephews, our nieces, our friends, our coworkers, that we might move through the world as people who 
reflect love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control, that we might further advance your love and your kingdom into the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, we'll see you next weekend. We have Tim Tebow, his wife, Demi. Have a great week, CCV.